Now on the subject of the kingdom of God, alternatively called the kingdom of heaven, they are both the same thing. My question to all of you is, how many of you have heard a full sermon on the kingdom of God? I confess, I have never heard. But I took the opportunity to study it. And the more I study, the more I realize how the body of Christ have moved away from the principal message of the Lord Jesus Christ. He didn't just come to preach the good news because the good news can be you struck the Ampat Echo. The good news can be, can be that uh, you have got better results in the exams. There are all kinds of good news, just as there are all kinds of bad news. So when you say the gospel, it is incomplete. Gospel of what? Jesus provides the answer. His principal message was the gospel of the kingdom of God. Everything else that pertains to the blessings of the people of God, to to the grace of God, salvations, the blood of Jesus, all this is within the kingdom of God. The principal message has remained in Jesus' case, the kingdom of God. That was his principal message. Where was the first kingdom ever established? It was established in the dim, dim shadows of thousands and thousands of years ago. When God in Genesis 2 created man and then he created woman. From the earth, he took the dust of the earth, he molded it into a man and he breathed his life into it. And man came into being. God provided them a kingdom. The kingdom of God. And God would come down in the evening. To have fellowship with Adam and Eve. It was a personal relationship. It was not a religion. It is God the father having an intimate relationship with Adam and Eve. He provided them with everything. And he says, when he made, when God made man, he says, he made it in the likeness of God, in the image of God. That's how much favored man was in the eyes of God. And let them rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air, over the livestock, over all the earth and over all creatures that move along the ground. He gave ownership. He gave power to Adam to rule the entire world. The world became the dominion of Adam. He provided him with everything in the Garden of Eden. But he had only one order. Do not eat of the fruit of good and evil. For if you do so, you will surely die. Every other fruit you can eat, even of the fruit of life, that gives them eternal life. They were made to have lived throughout all eternity. But then came the adversary of God, the devil himself. In the form of a serpent, he spoke to Eve and Eve, and he says, Mother Tola, look at that fruit on the tree of good and evil. Look at it. Isn't it so good, so succulent, so luscious? 
But Eve says, no, no, we can't. Otherwise, we will die. And then the devil is always very smart. He's an intelligent, intelligent creature. He was Lucifer, the archangel Lucifer, who wanted to be God like God was God. He asked Eve, did God really say that? She says, yes, if we eat of it, we will die. He says, if you eat of it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God. Oh, that's a different story. Wow, you can be like God. She took the fruit and ate it. And then Adam came. He let him have the rest of the fruit, the fruit of good and evil. They took it. And shame came upon them and they clothed themselves with a fig leaf. What did God do? Because God had dealt with Lucifer before. Before he threw him down to the earth with all the one third of the angels that were thrown to the earth. He said, threw him to the earth because... Lucifer, now called the devil, wanted to be like God himself. Now he's tempting Adam in the same way to be like God himself. Adam fell for it, he fell for it, and they were cast out of the Garden of Eden. Everything was deprived. The kingdom of God was taken away. The Holy Spirit that was with them was taken away. The glory that they had was taken away. And he drove them out of the garden. of Eden. Mankind lost the kingdom of God. And it took thousands of years. It took thousands of years when God spoke. First, to the prophet Nathan, who was an advisor and prophet to the, to the great King David of Israel. And what did he say to him? And this is the amazing thing about the, the, the Bible. The Bible is... God's interaction with men. 66 books. Majority of the books are the Old Testament and the rest in the New Testament. And he said, he said to he said the prophet Nathan said to King David, O oh, king, when your days are fulfilled and you rest with your fathers, I will set up a seed after you who will come from your body and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be his father and he shall be my son. God is not talking about the kingdom that, that will be restored to mankind through the line of David, but he will be his son and God will be his father. Then again, Isaiah, Isaiah says 700 over years before Christ came to the world. Nathan spoke about 3,000 years, no, uh, 3, years ago, about 1,000 years before Jesus came to establish the kingdom of God upon the earth. Isaiah saw the coming of the king 
and of his government. Government is the kingdom, kingdom government. Isaiah 9, 6 to 7. For unto us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders. And he'll be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. He was God himself. Of the increase of his government or kingdom and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. Similar to Nathan, the coming kingdom of God. And then the last one was the other great prophet, the prophet Daniel. This time, 500 over years before Christ came to the earth. Daniel saw the kingdom in graphic detail. He had this vision. In my vision, Daniel 7, 13, in my vision at night, I looked. And before me was one like a son of man coming with the clouds of heaven. Son of man was later to be to be identified by the Jews, by the Pharisees and the Sadducees as the Messiah. With the clouds of heaven means he will come with the angelic hosts. He approached the Ancient of Days, which is the name of God the Father, and was led into his presence. He was given authority, glory, and sovereignty and power. All peoples, nations, and men of every language worship him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away and his kingdom is one that will, that will never be destroyed. Three great prophets of God looked into the future and God told them I will establish the kingdom of God upon the earth through my son, the Messiah. Where did he find his realization? He found the realization when God chose Mary. He chose Mary to bear the Son of God. And this is fulfilled in Luke chapter 1, verse 31 to 33. Mary, you will be with child and will give birth to a son. You are good. You are to give him the name Yeshua, Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever. His kingdom will never end. The Old Testament is the New Testament conceived. The New Testament is the Old Testament revealed. When Gabriel came to Mary, he came to the realization of the promises of God through the three great prophets I mentioned just now. And when Jesus was born, and when he began to minister, After John the Baptist ushered in his ministry, he 
in the book of Matthew, chapter 3, the first verse of John the Baptist, fulfilling Isaiah, chapter 14, verse 3. He was preparing the way for the Lord Jesus to come. And the first words John the Baptist proclaimed, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. He was a cousin to the Lord Jesus Christ. And then, Jesus' own words. After his temptation by the devil in the wilderness, in Matthew 4, verse 17, the first words of Jesus was this. From that time on, what did he mean by that? Who knew? What did, what did he mean by that? From that time on. From the time that John the Baptist was imprisoned by King Herod and later executed by him. John had been taken away from the scene. He had baptized Jesus in the Jordan and he had proclaimed him to be the coming Messiah and the Son of God. And what was the first words that Jesus uttered? From that time on, when John was no longer on the scene, Jesus began to preach. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. The word near here means, is here. The kingdom of God is here. So, he was taking the kingdom of heaven down with him to earth. And when his ministry began, he established the kingdom of heaven upon the earth. Everything pointed to a kingdom. He did not point to a gospel. Good news alone. He pointed to the gospel of the kingdom of heaven. So we've gone through that. And let's see what Jesus spoke about in the course of his mission on earth. We must consider his own declarations concerning his purpose and assignment for coming into the world. Purpose and assignment. In Matthew 10 verse 7, <coughs> he again says, the kingdom of heaven is near, is here. Matthew 12, 28, he says, But if I drive out demons by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God has come upon me. Matthew 18, 23, Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. Matthew 24, 14, And this gospel of the kingdom will be Preach in the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. What must we preach for the kingdom of heaven to come? For the kingdom of kingdom of God, what must what must be preached before Jesus comes back to the earth for the second time? Preach the kingdom of heaven throughout the world as a testimony to all nations. All nations must be evangelized. They must have an opportunity to hear the gospel. Every race, culture, groups must hear. And then the end will come and Jesus will come upon the earth. And Luke 43 to 44, he says, I must preach the good news of the kingdom of God to the other towns also, because that is why I was sent. And he kept on preaching in the synagogues of Judea. And then he traveled from throughout the towns and the villages in Israel, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom of God. 
Then in Luke chapter 12, 31, he says, but seek you first his kingdom and his righteousness, and these things will be added to you. You know what this means? Seek you first the kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. What is the meaning of righteousness here? Righteousness here means, does not mean a religious, it's not a religious word. It is a political word. Seek his righteousness means to align yourself with God, to be in the right position with God. So that was it. And then he says, do not be afraid, little flock. For your father has been pleased to give you the kingdom. The law and the prophets were proclaimed until John. That time, Since that time, the good news of the kingdom of God has been preached. And everyone one is forcing his way into it. The words of Jesus. I don't want to read more because there are so many expressions of Jesus concerning the principal message to kingdom of God. But let me tell you, in his last exchange with the authorities, this time with Pontius Pilate, this is the conversation in John 18, 36, 37, between Jesus and Pontius Pilate. Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my disciples would fight to prevent my arrest by the Jews. But now my kingdom is from another place. Pontius Pilate says, you are a king then. Because there was accusation of the Jews that he called himself a king. Which is a which is a, is a penalty punished by is a offense punishable by death in the reign of Caesar. Jesus answered, "You are right in saying that I am a king. In fact, for this reason, I was born." And for this, I came into the world to testify to the truth. What was Jesus' purpose to be born? He was born to bring the kingdom of God into the world. That was his principal message to all of mankind. It was the only gospel that he ever preached. It was the gospel of the kingdom of God. He came not to bring a new religion or a new denomination. His good news that he brought the kingdom of heaven to earth. And anyone who would come into the kingdom could be reunite, reunited in spirit and fellowship with him. What? Did Jesus bring the kingdom for? Not to set up a religion, but men have made him a religion. Christianity is categorically not a religion. Men search for God. They are searching for a religion. Jesus came to establish a fellowship between the, you and the Godhead. And that men be restored to their full position and rights as children of God and citizens of his kingdom. Children of God, if you believe in him, he gives you the right to be called as children of God. When you become a children of God, a child of God, 
you've become a member of his royal household. And in Philippians 3.20, he says, your citizenship is in heaven. You are both a citizen as well as the member of the royal household of God in the kingdom of heaven. That is how exalted your position is. And once again, he plays us like, he, like, like his father plays Adam in the Garden of Eden, in a place of authority and dominion that God intended for us from the beginning, that redeemed men could be restored to eternal life the kingdom of God. The kingdom is not a religion. It is an intimate religion, uh, communion with God our Father. Mission on the earth. Let me sum it up for you. He, as I've already said to you, he came to reintroduce the kingdom of, of God on earth to men. He came to restore the righteousness and holiness of men by his death upon the cross and by the blood that he shed, the blood of the new covenant that can forgive us our sins and restore us to righteousness and holiness. He came to give the Holy Spirit to man that Adam lost. He came to retrain men for kingdom leadership. He came to restore the kingdom rule of God on earth through mankind. We are the instruments, the members of the royal household that will dominate, that would, would have dominion over the earth. Because Jesus is the king of kings. Why is he so called? Because he has a great family of kings and priests unto our God. Where does he say that? In the book of Revelation. The book of Revelation is the book that ends what Adam brought to the earth, a curse. The revelation was a closing chapter. So we'll talk more of that later on. He came to restore the man, to, uh, no, restore the kingdom rule of God on earth through mankind. Through the administration uh, to God's earthly spirit kings. We are spirit kings. We are spirit kings. And he came to restore us to personal relationship with Christ. A few nights ago, I called up Pastor Inki, Inki Ong. She had fallen and was paralyzed with a broken uh, disc at the spine. She was in deep pain. And I told her, we have a very deep relationship with our Savior. And I shared with her John 17, 20 to 23. Where Jesus says, I'm in the Father, I'm in the Father, and the Father is in me. You will be in us. He was talking about unity of us as Christians with him. He was talking about the unity of oneness of the church of the body of Christ with the Father. A church that is not divided. Unlike the Protestant movement, which is so badly divided according to uh, the uh, research in America by by uh, Gordon Conwell Seminary, 
in conjunction with Oral Roberts University and the E21, the Spirit, Spirit led Christians, Spirit empowered Christians. The seminary came up with this conclusion. There are 41,000 denominations amongst the Protestants. Jesus says, be one in us. And then you will see the glory of God, which God gave me and I give to you as a united church. And then he goes on to talk about complete unity in the Godhead of us as individuals and of the church in him. A church universal and indivisible. More obeyed in disobedience than in obedience. But I told her, once you experience this glory that comes when you are one with God the Father, God the Son, and the Son having given you the Holy Spirit, the entire Holy Trinity is true and thrown in your heart. And you come into deep communion with him until you merge into the Godhead. Anything you ask, he will give to you. Jesus talked in verse 23 of the perfection of unity. That is what Jesus came to the world to establish an intimate relationship with you. All 367, 66, 7 of us here in this Zoom. Deep, intimate, until we lose ourselves. In the sea of the Godhead. And then she began to feel the power of God coming into her. And she felt a power moving on to her spine. And she said, what a wonderful feeling. She was one with the Holy Trinity. She was made perfect. She was made glorious in that unification. That is what every Christian should strive for in this world of Protestant disunity. And the years before, before, before the humanism came into the world, how Christianity, the different denominations were fighting with the Catholic and the Catholics among themselves, and the, no, not amongst themselves, the Protestants warring amongst themselves, in Europe, they cause disgust in so many people of Western Europe that they, they abandon God. And that's why Western Europe is dying. But yet, their numbers are still, as a percentage of population, is still much higher than that in West Malaysia. We are in a critical condition. A few days, yesterday I called her. She says she's walking now in her room. Inky is walking in her room and the pain has largely abated. If you are God in God, fully in spirit in him, Oh boy, you can ask. I've asked so many things. I've asked for healing. I've asked for anointing, for mass deliverance. And he gave it to me. He gave it to me because of the intimacy. That is why Jesus brought the kingdom on the earth. But the kingdom is a kingdom of responsibility. You have your duties. 
we have made Christianity is such an easy, easy thing. You can have people in church sitting in the pew, being disciple from the time they became a Christian until they die. And they don't go out to obey the Great Commission, which is the principal commission of the Lord Jesus Christ to every king and priest every Christian in his kingdom. You cannot disobey. Because his kingship is not a democracy. His kingship is not a constitutional monarchy like in Malaysia or like the Queen of England, Queen Elizabeth II. She's a constitutional monarch. She reigns, but she does not rule. Here, Jesus is an absolute king of kings and lord of lords. His commands are to be obeyed. And if you do as disobey them, there is a penalty as Adam paid the penalty when he disobeyed God by eating of the fruit of good and evil. Christianity is not as easy as we all make it. I know of Christians all their lives, disciples by the church, never bringing another soul into the kingdom. This is something we must be aware of. I will just give you a few quotations from great men of God of the past. Hudson Taylor, the one who brought the China Inland Mission into the interiors of China, the gospel of the kingdom to China. And he says, the Great Commission is not an option to be considered. It is a command to be obeyed and disobeyed at your own personal risk. Bill Bright, the famous evangelist, said there is no higher calling or greater privilege for any of us here today than being involved in helping to fulfill the Great Commission, the order of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords to you and to me to fulfill the Great Commission. John Wesley, the man who brought revival to England, for 52 years, the longest revival that I can think of, next to only to the book of Acts. You have one business and one business on earth as a Christian to save souls. David Livingston said, the Great Commission is still the mission statement of the church. Is it the mission statement of your church? Does your church teach you how to evangelize? My church, FGA, has started to do that. To teach their members and about 800, maybe now, by now, a thousand of our members have been trained in the uh, Evangelism explosion. But most churches do not. They are what we call inward looking churches. And they're according to the best minds in Christianity, an inward looking church is a dying church, explaining the reason why. West Malaysia has only 3% population. When our cousins already have reached 62% 10 years ago, and they will be 72% by the year 2050, we will be probably left with 1%. Or even less. We are a disappearing church. Very much like the smile of the Cheshire cat. 
smile fading away. This is very serious message to you. It comes from the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And when we do the Great Commission, do it like Jesus did. Do it like the apostles did. Preach the gospel of the kingdom of God with power. For the kingdom of God is power itself. Paul says, I do not come to you with persuasive words of men. But preaching the gospel with power demonstration of the spirit and of his power. When you heal people, when you deliver people, I have since the Lord gifted me with a deliverance, I've, I've prayed and delivered thousands of people. Not all were delivered, but a significant number were delivered. And when they make the altar call, they come running to the altar because they know that the kingdom you serve is a kingdom of authority and of power forever and ever. He has equipped us with the Holy Spirit. Do you know Holy Spirit empowered Christians are the fastest of all growing religions in the world? Even higher than our cousins. They grew from the year 2000 to the present day, 2020, at a rate four times the rate of growth of the church of Jesus Christ. 400% faster than the church of Christian Christ. Do you know that the Catholics have 160 million charismatics amongst them? And they have a separate wing called the charismatic wing. Blessed by John Paul the 23rd in 1962 and all the way down to the present Pope, have acknowledged the power and the authority of the Holy Spirit. 160 million. Together with the Catholics, we are about 750 million Pentecostal charismatics in the world. By the time 2050 comes along, when we will probably be 1% or half a percent in West Malaysia, unless we obey the Great Commission. The Pentecostal spirit empowered Christians and Catholics will grow over 1 billion people. The Holy Spirit was to empower you to do the Great Commission. What did most of us do? We kept him locked up in our hearts. We're still in the refrigerator of our heart. And even worse, in the deep freeze of our heart. He is grieved. And do not think that when you grieve God, in the third person of the Godhead. That there will be good news to you when the, when the Messiah and the Son of God comes back to earth. When he comes down with his angels and the rapture takes place, you will see your fellow Christians rising from the grave to be reunited with their spirit body in the skies. You will still be on the earth. Those living who are spirit filled, spirit empowered, they will rise up to be with the Lord 
those who obey the great commission of the King of Kings who rise in the air and you are left behind. There is a price for disobedience all through the Bible. Do not think it is so easy as you are being taught. There are duties and responsibilities. A branch that bears much fruit is a testimony to your devotion and obedience to your Lord. If you are a branch that does not have any fruits in them, and you are a branch of the vine, which is Jesus Christ, and the gardener is the Father God, then you are a lukewarm Christian, like the Christians in the church of Laodicea, neither hot nor cold. And Jesus said, I will spit you out of my mouth. I would suggest you have a word with your pastors. On this. Tell them to preach the kingdom of God. For heaven's sake, there's a principal message of the Lord Jesus Christ when he came to the earth. Don't have programs and programs teaching this and that. Min minor things. When the major thing is left untaught. Please. For the sake of your own soul. Awake. Awake. And we don't want to see. The Malaysian church continue to decline. Tough job. Just to increase by 1%, you need 320,000 salvations throughout the whole of Malaysia. Just 1%. At the stage most of the churches are in today, they are in no position. No position to obey the great commandment of God. They must wake up. There's no true way about it. To all of you who have heard this testimony of mine, this discourse of mine with all of you, please, when you get the video, share it with your friends with your parents, with everyone that is dear to you. Share, share the gospel of the kingdom of God with them. Why? Because when the rapture comes and Jesus comes upon the earth, with his angels, he will rule for a thousand years upon the earth. Do you know the gospel of the kingdom of heaven is not to take you to heaven. Heaven is only a holding place until the Lord Jesus comes back at his second coming. As his feet comes down onto the Mount of Olives the accompanying saints and angels. Will you be there? Will you be there, my brother, my sister? It's a horrible thought, I know. It's better to be warned and to repent and change as, rather than not to, be, to repent at all and remain the same. And would you know what Revelation says? One verse six. Jesus Christ has caused us to become kings and priests unto his Father God. Then in verse five, verse ten. He repeats the first part. 
And Jesus has caused us to become kings and priests unto his Father God. And they, those who make it into the kingdom of God, when he comes down for a thousand year reign, you will reign on the earth. Just as Adam before the fall ruled in the kingdom of God in the garden of Eden. How beautiful is the Bible. How beautiful is the constitution of the kingdom of God. The holy Bible. How beautiful. It starts and it ends with paradise on earth. Garden of Eden on earth is restored. And we shall rule the earth with him. Don't miss that out because you are lazy or because you believe what you are told. No, we don't. You just need to sit in church, pay your tithe. No, son. No children. He has conferred the kingdom on you. You have a responsibility. And then at the end of the thousand years, God will recreate the earth and the heavens. Will you be there? And we shall reign with him. My imagination runs wild. The earth is a very tiny speck in the cosmos created by God. One day, we will rule planets and universes to be transported at great speed to the planets up there. My imagination running wild. But God is the God of the impossible. Thank you, friends. I hope as I sum up now, He is king over his kingdom. And you are his kings and his priests. Discharge your responsibilities and duties with every diligence that you are capable of. Because the rewards is far beyond what you can imagine or think. What God has prepared for those who love him and are called according to his purpose. What is man that you consider him? What is a son of man that you should care for him? He cares for us so much. He wants the best for his children. You understand, he wants the best for you. You are the sons and daughters of God. Please, for the rest of your life, whatever is left, work with diligence, obeying him. And your efforts will bear fruits. By this, the Lord will know you, whether you are fruitless or you are a bearer of an abundance of fruits. Thank you. God bless you. Go away, go away home with this thought. Go down on your knees today and pray. And ask the Lord whether what I said to you is the truth of the kingdom of God or not. Ask, pray, desire for the greater gifts, desire for power. Desire, if you have not received the Holy Spirit, be born again, receive the Holy Spirit. If you you kneel down and ask God, give me the Holy Spirit. If he doesn't give it to you, go seek somebody who can anoint you with the by baptism of the Holy Spirit. Thank you. It has been a privilege to share with all of you tonight. This is an important message. I know you will all make it to heaven. 
and then come back to rule on the earth. Perhaps, who knows, one day you will rule the universe of the cosmos. In Jesus' name, we all say, Amen.